NSA discloses a vulnerability to Microsoft so it can be patched quickly. Intrusion Truth describes 13 front companies for China's APT-40. They're interested in offensive cyber capabilities. Area One reports that Russia's GRU conducted a focused phishing campaign against Ukraine's Burisma Group, the energy company that figured prominently in the House's resolution to impeach U.S. President Trump. And the U.S. Justice Department moves for access to encrypted communications. And now a word from our sponsor, Privacy Guard. By now, you might have heard of the scary stats of how many times identity theft happens and of data breaches happening to big companies, companies that you might have done business with. But Privacy Guard members can have more peace of mind. Privacy Guard takes privacy personal. Protecting your privacy means protecting the integrity of your name, your reputation, and your identity. Privacy Guard is a comprehensive, personalized privacy protection service that helps protect you from identity theft. Privacy Guard's public and dark web scanning will keep an eye on your private information. Plus, with Privacy Guard's 24-7 triple bureau credit monitoring, you can be alerted if a certain change to your credit score occurs, which could be an indication of identity theft. Your identity and privacy belong to you. Privacy Guard works to help keep it that way. To learn more, go to privacyguard.com. That's privacyguard.com. And we thank Privacy Guard for sponsoring our show. Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by McAfee. Security fueled by insight. Intelligence lets you respond to your environment. Insights empower you to change it. Identify with machine learning. Defend and correct with deep learning. Anticipate with artificial intelligence. McAfee, the device to cloud cybersecurity company. Go to McAfee.com slash insights. Still on assignment in Seattle, Washington and looking forward to heading home. I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Tuesday, January 14th, 2020. Today is Patch Tuesday, and late yesterday, Krebs on Security said that sources told him Microsoft would issue an unusually important patch for a core cryptographic component shared by all versions of Windows. That module is crypt32.dll, which Microsoft characterizes as handling certificate and cryptographic messaging functions in the crypto API. The Washington Post this morning reported that the flaw was discovered by the U.S. National Security Agency, which quietly reported it to Microsoft rather than weaponizing the vulnerability. The flaw is said to be comparable in severity to the one exploited by Eternal Blue, which NSA also discovered and disclosed to Microsoft upon learning that others had gained access to the tool. The flaw to be patched today has a variety of implications for authentication and protection of sensitive data, and it could also, in principle, be exploited to spoof digital signatures associated with particular bits of software. Early reports said that Microsoft had quietly informed some government agencies of the vulnerability, but this seems in some respects to have it backward. It was the U.S. government, specifically NSA, that informed Microsoft. NSA commented early this afternoon in a media call, Cybersecurity Directorate Head Ann Newberger said NSA discovered the crucial vulnerability in the course of its routine look at the range of tools it uses. Given the vulnerability's severity, NSA decided to notify Microsoft to help them expedite patching. NSA itself recommends that network owners immediately implement the patch, as, she said, we ourselves will be doing. When Microsoft posts the patch this afternoon, they will give attribution to NSA. NSA agreed to attribution as a way of building trust, of showing their work. They also wanted the attribution as a way of leaning forward, to raise awareness and a proper sense of urgency. These represent, she said, an evolution of NSA's new commitment to openness and the building of trust with the larger community. Asked why NSA decided to disclose rather than weaponize the vulnerability, Director Newberger said that in this case it was NSA's judgment that its mission was best served through disclosure. This is part of overall trust building. The CyberWire asked if this disclosure represented the ordinary working of the vulnerabilities equities process. Ms. Newberger explained that the vulnerabilities equities process, a National Security Council process, concerns itself with retention decisions. But in this case, the process didn't need to be invoked. NSA quickly made a determination to share the vulnerability it discovered, and so the VEP wasn't engaged. 
This sort of decision to disclosure, Ms. Neuberger said, should be regarded as NSA's normal way of doing business. When security is enhanced by disclosure, NSA will decide to disclose. Neither NSA nor Microsoft have seen any exploitation of the vulnerability in the wild, and if you'll take NSA's advice, you'll apply today's Microsoft patch as soon as you can. ZDNet reports that the anonymous security analysts of Intrusion Truth have uncovered some 13 companies operating for the most part from Hainan, a large island province in the South China Sea, that serve as fronts for APT-40. APT-40 is a threat group associated with the Chinese government and best known for espionage on behalf of the People's Liberation Army Navy. An order of battle note, that may be an odd-sounding name, but it's the one China's navy is known by, the People's Liberation Army Navy. Intrusion Truth posted its findings this past Thursday and Friday. The 13 Hainan companies are all hiring, and they're hiring people with offensive cyber skills and useful linguistic capabilities. For example, some of the job ads look for female English speakers. As Intrusion Truth sums it up, quote, We have multiple companies with identical descriptions and job adverts, overlapping contact details and office locations, but different names recruiting for offensive hacking skills. Like Boyusek, Haiying Haitai, Antorsoft, and others, these companies have very little presence on the Internet outside of these adverts. It's, of course, possible that offensive skills can be, as they often are, put to defensive use in red teaming and penetration testing, but the skill sets the companies are interested in would seem to mark them as organizations of interest. They've also found an academic connection, one Gu Zhain, a professor in the Information Security Department of Hainan University. His CV describes him as a former member of the People's Liberation Army. In itself, that's no surprise. There's no shortage of PLA veterans in China. It's a pretty big army. Professor Gu is also down as the contact person for one of the front companies that's itself linked to the other 12. It's an interesting example of how researchers develop connections among cyber actors. Intrusion Truth promises more posts on the Hainan group of companies in the near future. It's a new year, and that means predictions are hot on many minds as we try to align security budgets with resources. Haiyan Song is Senior Vice President and General Manager of Security Market at Splunk, and she shares these insights. Cloud adoption, I would say, is still in the early stages in terms of fully understand how this new paradigm of cloud computing is going to impact our day-to-day. You know, we love all the technologies like the new containers, the Kubernetes. And in the meantime, is also this whole emergence of API-driven economy in the cloud, right? People can build solutions without having to really build the entire stack. They can leverage a lot of services that's already in the cloud. What it does, though, is now you have a very complicated digital supply chain for what you're delivering. And all of the things are happening in the cloud computing speed, which, you know, we call it machine speed. Uh, So we think what's really going to happen this year, and at least the prediction, is it's no longer just, oh, we found a misconfiguration and we're just going to take some data from, you know, S3 buckets. I think it's going to be they'll figure out how the service, it's sort of linked together and try to disrupt something in the middle and it's going to be so much more impactful to the services or the customers of the services. And it's happening so fast that we have to find a way to automate the responses. What about um, some of these applications of technology uh, that are that are coming along, you know, people who are up to no good? I, I'm thinking of of things like deep fakes, you know, particularly as as we head into um, an election season, you know, people will be worried about uh, the things they're going to see on the news and so forth. Are, are things like deep fakes, is that something that's on your radar? It's definitely something that we always talk about as part of this concept. Humans is still, I would say, the weakest link when it comes to thinking about what the best practices are and, and to protect yourself And the human factor continue to be a major sort of threat vector, if you will. Uh, I just saw the latest news. I think uh, Snapchat just sort of invested in a company or bought a company. And that's really specializing in deep fake technology. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's sort of a sign of that's becoming more and more mainstream. 
And I think 2020 was the election year. It's going to be a perfect storm uh, for how this technology is going to be, you know, leveraged to for social engineering. And I'm sure it's going to bring a lot of, you know, entertainment for people who, who are sort of, you know, looking at those things. But mm-hmm. I think uh, it's definitely going to exploit uh, the, the weakness in, in the human link, if you will. Yeah, as we're heading into this new year, how do you describe uh, your own attitude towards it? Are are you optimistic? Are are you cautious? Uh, how do you think uh, things are going to play out this year? I'm always a glass half full person, so uh, I I love the technology, the the adoption of new technology. I think is going to bring us many different cross pollination. How to really learn from the new cloud paradigm? How do we learn from, you know, all the natural language processing that brought all this access to technology. I think one thing that I'm always uh, really trying to get to our audiences and customers is uh, think of automation as one of the key technologies to really help you with making the shift to the cloud paradigm and knowing that automation is there to help us. There's a lot more benefit to be had and, uh, I thought I would just always want to share that perspective. That's High End Song from Splunk. Area One has released research indicating that Russia's GRU in November of 2019 began a phishing campaign against the Ukrainian energy company Burisma Holdings. The goal was to obtain email credentials from Burisma, its subsidiaries, and its partners. Burisma is the company whose connections to former U.S. Vice President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, were at the center of the impeachment inquiry directed at U.S. President Trump, who wanted a Ukrainian investigation of those connections and is accused of having abused his office in pressuring his Ukrainian counterpart. Phishing is a common method of attack, and as the New York Times and Wall Street Journal point out, it's how Fancy Bear, the GRU, accessed Democratic Party accounts in 2016. What specifically was Fancy Bear after, once it had those credentials? Area One says it doesn't know, but the two most probable inferences are that they were interested in either collection against a target of interest or in preparing some influence operation, or perhaps both. Yesterday, U.S. Attorney General Barr released the results of the Justice Department's inquiry into the December 6 shootings at Pensacola Naval Air Station. The investigators concluded, as expected, that the shooter was Lieutenant Mohammed Saeed al-Shamrani, of the Royal Saudi Air Force, and that his actions were an act of terrorism motivated by what the Attorney General characterized as jihadist ideology. That conclusion was supported by inspection of the shooter's social media posts, which indicated that he had become radicalized. While investigation determined that the shooter acted alone, an inquiry into the social media presence of other Saudi military personnel determined that 21 of those training in the U.S. were in possession of similar material— None of this, the Attorney General said, warranted prosecution under U.S. law, but the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia determined that their engagement with such material constituted conduct unbecoming of an officer. The Kingdom disenrolled the 21 officers from training in the U.S. and returned them to Saudi Arabia late yesterday. The investigation also constitutes another round in the dispute over access to encrypted communication. The Attorney General says the shooter's two iPhones have been recovered and restored to usability, he damaged each of them, but that investigators are unable to read their encrypted contents. The Justice Department has asked for Apple's help in unlocking them, which Apple has not provided. The Attorney General called upon Apple and the tech industry generally to work with the Justice Department to find some middle ground in the crypto wars. And now, a word from our sponsor, LastPass. LastPass is an award-winning security solution that helps millions of individuals and over 61,000 organizations navigate their online lives easily and securely. Businesses can maximize productivity while still maintaining effortless, strong security with LastPass. Each entry point in your organization can compromise your business's security, LastPass Identity can minimize risk and give your IT team a breakthrough integrated single sign-on, password management, and multi-factor authentication. LastPass Identity enables you to manage and control user access for all access points in your organization, add an additional layer of security to every single login through multi-factor authentication, 
securely authenticate into your work using biometrics such as fingerprint or face, deliver a passwordless login experience for your employees while securing every password in use through enterprise password management, and gain an integrated view across all access and authentication tasks to know which employees are accessing what, when, and where. To learn more, visit lastpass.com. That's lastpass.com. And we thank LastPass for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Joe Kerrigan. He's from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, also my co-host on the Hacking Humans podcast. Joe, great to have you back. Hi, Dave. Uh, interesting article came by. Uh, this is uh, from Gadgets 360, but I've been I've seen this being covered in a variety of places. And this is uh, Google is being urged by over 50 organizations, including DuckDuckGo, mm-hmm. to take action against Android vendors offering bloatware. Right. What's going on here? So what happens when you buy an Android phone from a manufacturer like HTC or Samsung or a myriad of other manufacturers is you get these apps on the phone mm-hmm. uh, that you can't uninstall. Out of the box. Out of the box. Yeah. The phone comes with these apps, and I've experienced this frustration with both HTC and Samsung, personally. Okay. Uh-huh. And there, they have legitimate concerns that there are some privacy issues with these apps. First off, uh, and security issues as well. They're, they're not updatable. Um, they don't they don't get updates unless it's an update pushed out through the cell phone provider many mm. times. The apps are not installed through the Google Play Store, so they're not subject to the uh, scrutiny that those apps go through. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, you can argue about how good that scrutiny is, but these apps don't get any scrutiny. They're just installed by default, and they, a lot of times, will leak information about the user. Hmm. So... But I, I'm gonna I'm gonna also point something else out here that uh, that these organizations may or may not understand, and that is that there is the Android One program, which was designed originally for emerging markets, but it's kind of expanded. And one of the benefits of the Android One program is that in order for a phone to be considered Android One, an Android One phone, it has to be running stock Android, which is the same operating system that comes on the Google devices, hmm. like the Pixel Three or the old Nexus devices. Okay. Now, my first smartphone was an HTC smartphone, and it had an interface called HTC Sense. So that's kind of the benefit that these people, these manufacturers will say, is that we have a lot better Android experience because we'll overlay our own interface over top of it, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? But when I got fed up with my Samsung devices uh, and, and finally went into the store and said, I don't care, just give me a stock Android device, and I bought a Nexus 6, I found that interface to be very clean and very enjoyable. And then my next phone was an LG phone that didn't have the stock Android experience again. Yeah. I, I found I missed the stock Android experience. So I went back and I bought a, um, for my, my, the phone that I currently have, I have a Pixel 3, which, of course, comes with the, the stock Android experience. Now, okay. the Pixel 3, I think, is prohibitively expensive. And I would dare say overpriced. But there are... Other phones out there in the Android One program that are more competitively priced and have the same stock Android apps without any of the bloatware and without any of the security issues that these folks are talking about here. Well, let me ask you this. So the phone that you have now, did that come with any bloatware on it? It did not. It did not. Okay. Mm-hmm. So by and, and I think there's that's one of the points here is right. that if you're willing to pay a premium price, you can get phones that don't have this sort of bloatware, and certainly over on the over on the Apple side of, of things, um, iOS devices come with no bloatware. Correct. But that's a that's a premium price. Right. But the the Android One phones are not premium price phones. But like, part of the way that the cheap phones are financed is through the installation of this bloatware. In other words, the manufacturer is making some money on the back end. Yeah. And that's part of how they can make the phones so inexpensive. And what the point I'm trying to get to is that. Isn't everyone entitled to good security? You right. shouldn't just need to pay a premium to have a secure device in a world where we're so dependent on these devices. Agreed. But yeah. the Android One program phones are not prohibitively <clears throat> expensive. They're actually a lot cheaper than these phones here. Like, you can get an Android uh, One phone for about 400 bucks. So you're saying, uh, if this is a concern of yours, go out and look for the Android One right. Get an labeled Android One phone, phone. Right. and that won't have the it bloatware. W- it won't have the bloatware. It'll come with Android uh, stock Android installed. You get security updates, monthly security updates guaranteed for two years. 
It's a pretty good program. But that precludes you from getting the cool, flashy devices from like Samsung, HTC, and LG. They, I see. They don't have that. But again, those phones are also expensive. Mm-hmm. So there is an inexpensive option for, for users to get. In fact, I think my next phone will probably be an Android One phone, mm-hmm. a less expensive Android One phone. Hmm. All right. Well, it's an interesting push, if, if nothing else. I agree 100%. Yeah. Yeah, th- this is a privacy push, and I'm all in favor of whenever that happens. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, Joe Kerrigan, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Dave. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily news brief at thecyberwire.com. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Observit, the leading insider threat management platform. Learn more at observit.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Harold Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>